Fantastic. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to be here as usual. Um, I'm Hello from Mexico, and I'm going to talk about creating perfumes in a time of crisis. The system is changing, and it has been for a few years. The COVID crisis burst all the bubbles that we were collectively ignoring, and now we're in front of a new world. Suddenly, the flavors and fragrance industry became an essential industry. Alcohol is not used for luxurious perfume brands, but for essential hand sanitizers. Our nose becomes this precious gate to our lungs, and the first thing many people lose when they're infected. We cover it with masks and take care not to introduce our dirty fingers inside. The invisible become the main topic of our lives, picturing the virus in many ways. On the other hand, people are walking by themselves, experiencing empty parks full of blossoming flowers, families cook three meals together a day, learning to make bread, house gardening, searching for pastimes that would soon become habits. Single people look at their new perfume bottle with nostalgia, and couples that are far away hang on to a piece of clothing with the vague aroma of their loved ones. What was a neglected commodity, bar soaps, is now the single most important thing. And it is with surprise that we were planning to go to Mars, but that as a society, we didn't know how to wash our hands. The world has changed. And in this world, clean is the new sexy. And I got a bit carried away and forgot to introduce myself again, but I currently work as an industrial perfumer in Mexico for Simrise. And I create laundry soaps for Guatemala, fabric softener for Mexico, or creams for Brazil. And of course, as Saskia said, I, during the night, I try other more experimental versions of perfumery. My generation has always known the fragrance industry in crisis. In the year 2016, when I was a trainee perfumer in London, a BSF factory, one of the biggest suppliers of chemical ingredients in Germany, caught fire, producing the biggest crisis in the fragrance industry. A few years later, we suffered directly from global warming when the Rhine got dry due to months without rain. And again, BSF could not supply by boat one key ingredient. These are just two of the many explosions and unexpected changes we suffered in the past years. These events, they strike like lightning and the industry needs to, needs to react quickly. The consequences were raw material shortages, price increase, variations in the quality, merciless competition from other industries. Raw materials like Hedion, Iso Super, or Didro Mersenol, that were considered cheap commodities, suddenly saw their price multiply by three or more. What was used like a solvent by some perfumers became materials we searched to replace. Long-standing conventions disappeared in the blink of an eye, and the sacred formulations were all modified to some extent. Perfumers had to take quick decisions and manage risks. We went more to the factories and, for some of us, learned to make our formulation simpler, shorter, taking out what wasn't really making any olfactory effect in our perfumes. At the same time, other crises are gradual, slower, more discreet. The rise in public concern about health, environment, and exploitation has provoked a time of extreme regulation. This has become a slow crisis that makes us analyze everything that has been done and that will be made. Essential materials like Ogmos, Castorium, Lilial, Nitro masks were found to be a risk factor to people's health and to the concerning issues of sustainability that we can no longer ignore. Once again, forcing perfumers creativity to find replacements. This influenced the research of new molecules greatly. Every laboratory had to find molecules that smelled like lily of the valley to, repl to replace Lilial. Essential oils were fractionated to take out undesirable molecules, and biodegradable chemicals became the new trend. Technical perfumers became more important than ever, and the regulatory departments grew quickly. This paradox between slow regulation work and explosive crisis decision making is what affects creativity oscillating between extreme respect of each, of each ingredient and brutal reformulation of formulas. But this crisis, they were very specific to the fragrance industry. COVID is an external health crisis that had an effect on every industry, 
including ours. Once again, we realized how connected we were to other sectors. The lockdown meant closing shopping malls, empty duty freeze, no social e event to wear perfume at, putting on hold the French fragrance business for a few months. At the same time, panic buyers stock up on soaps, bleach, and all type of cleaners. Conscious buyers that were not using money in restaurants or hairdresser anymore, they started buying premium shampoos and hair coloring instead of the affordable ones to make some kind of spa at home. The fresh smell of Lysol became the aroma of purity, the proof that we were safe. The harsh smell of bleach will be remembered with less disdain and more like the reassuring aroma of a protected home. Of course, apart from the ones that drank it. If perfume was considered by some like a superfluous, superfluous thing, it has now been upgraded by official authorities to the statue of essential. Like one of my mentors used to say, perfume and cleaning products makes everyday life more pleasant. It is a fact that perfumers and their team have never stopped working and creating even during the biggest crisis. Let me give you a free example of how some visionary characters use the dramatic crisis in, in a creative way, and in the end, they end up revolutionizing a whole industry. If you think about the Chypre de Coty, it was launched in 1917, and World War I was still raging. This new factory structure became one of the most important archetypes, even today, the Chypre. And it was a response to the empowerment of women in France that took on their shoulders the whole country and the men and the work that men could not do anymore. Women wanted to change the floral fragrances they were associated with and were perfumed with more character. Mitsuko from Guerlain that arrived a few, years, a few years later is a reinterpretation of this new femininity inspired by the Chypre. Femme de Rochasse is said to have been developed by Rudnitska during World War II with the materials that he had available. So you can imagine that during a war, it's hard to find some materials. And there is some, some recordings of Wodnitska saying how hard it was to find patchouli and that he had to exchange some aldehyde they were producing with patchouli, for example. So it, it was very, very interesting how, how he created this fragrance in these difficult times. The legend says that he found an old drum of metalionon that smelled incredible in the back of the factory and it had some leather facets and he named it Fusank. He actually found a creative way of dealing with, sh with shortages and create one of the perfumer that was the most important in the post-war era. Shortages of alcohol actually forced them to launch only 300 bottles at, at the liberation of Paris. What they did is that they played in the sense of exclusivity and those bottles were hand signed by Lalique in pure crystal. Another less, more pragmatic example is the liquid detergent Tide. It's the first liquid detergent and it was launched in 1946, just after World War II. This was due to the obstination of one person, David Bayer, who continued to research this new technology in secret, while his management shifted to war production and was affected by the limitation of this or that chemical. It was launched in a radical different way than they would normally do. And we could imagine that after living through some times full of risk, they were willing to take, to take a, little, a little more risk themselves. Tide is today worth 14% of global liquid detergent market. It can be by creative genius, lack of choice or obstination or even luck that some manage to survive such big crises and in some cases even become better. A crisis that is as big as COVID and where we have so much time to think during lockdowns could be an opportunity, to, an opportunity to rethink the way we work, to focus on the world we're currently living in and to restart everything that we do and shift toward the essential, of, uh, towards sustainability, health, respect, inclusivity, by realizing that we are all connected. In my case, I have seen that customers have been shifting toward creating cleaning products that consumers are so interested to get. It's been three months that I work from home and I would have never believed it was possible a few months ago. I work differently, spending more time analyzing my formulas, following more patiently the evolution of my fragrances, connecting more with my colleagues 
from all around the world. The realization that home office would be so effective is something we will definitely continue to explore at Simrise. The flexibility of this type of format give us clues on how to push the boundaries, the boundaries of perfumery even further. I have been following closely what happened in the world and getting inspired to think how could perfume make this world a better place? How could it stand to its title of essential and fighting equality be more inclusive? Could we make hospital feel cleaner or at least more pleasant for patients and doctors who feel to feel less, less stress? I'm curious to see how consumers' preference will adapt to this. We are already seeing a shift from central perfumes to ones that inspire comfort. Will we see feminine fragrances with a top note of Lysol inside? Will consumers demand, demand even more powerful perfumes to be able to smell them across a, face mask, fa across a face mask? How will we do with factor installation respecting social distancing? Just like Ernesto Beau added a direct war memory to a traditional floral structure and created Chanel number no. five, creating the most modern perfumer of the time, perfume of the time, sorry. We need to acknowledge that the world has changed for better or for worse. It is flexibility, creativity, and obstination that are the key elements that will lead us to innovation. Let us believe that the crisis can be the engine to create the structures of the future we want to live in. Thank you very much. Now, Dave, I have a question for you. I was reading your interview from 2018 with Eddie Baliki, who I see is in the audience. And you had mentioned that some of your personal hopes for the industry were to maybe see labels like slavery free um, on perfume bottles. And also um, you mentioned that you think transparency at the time of 2018 was uh, the future of perfumery. Do you think we've gotten closer to either of those goals in the last two years? Uh, we do. And um, it's, again, is this uh, double, not crisis, but double uh, movements in the, in the industry, you know, the, the very quick responses and the slow regulatory work. I think reg regulation has focused a lot on, on people's security and health. And uh, we have, for example, sometimes harsher regulations than flavor industry, for example, which is a little bit strange, but that, that's how they do it. And um, concerning the supply chains, they, with all the explosions that we had and the problems with, uh, with some countries, I think you have both scenarios. People that try always to find more um, cheaper materials and that don't really look for their for the, the respect they should. And people that try to own their supply chain a lot better. And therefore try at Simers, for example, we have some very nice initiatives in Madagascar where where there's a holistic approach to ginger, for example, or to vetiver or some kind of uh, essential oils. And this holistic approach allow us, when I put some of these materials in my perfumes, I know is doing something good uh, somewhere else in the world. It's, it's easier to do with uh, essential oils, of course. And I dream of a world where also chemicals will be, could be labeled as not only cruelty free or, or slavery free, but also to improve the lives of villages all around the world and closer to where we are. Eddie uh, actually has a question. Um, what do you think will happen to olfactory symbolism and association in the context of hypersterility? Uh, and, and follow up question, which scenarios will be an ongoing obsession with coronavirus and public health? It, again, it's, it's really interesting to, to imagine that uh, maybe some functional, some products from the functional world will trickle up. And I'm a strong believer in the trickling up of uh, from detergents to fine fragrance. And when you think of concept of clean, for example, some of the citrus notes, you can see that uh, they, they come, the, the immersional come from functional perfumery, for example, and now is present in all possible uh, fine fragrances. So I can imagine that the concept of clean will be associ associated with the detergent, the, the powders and the bleach and the floor cleaners around the world. Again, this is very location specific 
and a lavender in Mexico smells very different from a lavender in Brazil and in, in France or the UK or China. So, so it's going to be an opportunity for us to, to dig in more in the local markets and understand the, the evolution. But now, to, today we have evolution, an evolution that is more uh, uniform in the whole world because brand, uh, brands are so global now. But I remember this story from a Vietnamese uh, manufacturer of, of liquid detergent that when they had a, a blocus, so, so they could not import any fragrance from anywhere, their, their liquid deter detergents used to smell of citronella oil that they used to make themselves. And so I always wondered if Vietnamese people have this strong association with citronella oil from to be clean, for example, or the smell of their family home or clean clothes. And symbolism, yeah, for me, is going to be a more bigger, stronger adaptation, uh, stronger tolerance to harsh chemicals. And the next one, the, the scenario ongoing obsession with coronavirus and the hyper sterility. Yeah, hyper sterility, but, but at the same time, is never truly sterile. And, and I, I think we were going that way a little bit already with, with a lot of concern on fragrance in spaces. But there, there is this story again of uh, Le Fruit Défendu that uh, Poiré launched. I believe it's Poiré, yeah. Let me see my notes. Yeah, Paul Poiré launched the Fruit Défendu just after the world, the, the world, 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 world one. You can imagine France was completely destroyed. Like people wanted to survive again, no? And they were not thinking of many things. And you have Paul Poiré that launches. Uh, a perfume with a campaign that is very eroticized and and very like out of place a little bit and he got a lot of criticism about it but again he created one of the forgotten archetypes of perfume and and it was a response to the direct sterility of the time like of the destruction he created an opulent perfume he eroticized perfumery again to give people life that is the opposite of of death and, uh, and of destruction. So you could imagine that maybe, maybe perfume brands and people that are more, less conservative will, will probably launch even more opulent perfumes. I think we'll, as, as always, we will have dichotomies in the creative process and, and I'm really looking forward to see what goes out of that. Thank you so much. Um, Lisa, I see you've raised your hand. I'd like to allow you to chat so you can ask your question directly. I was wondering, um, I'm recovering from COVID, so I'm wondering just in terms of trends, you know, I'm praying, of course, that my sense of smell returns, but just in terms of trends, um, it was so interesting that you mentioned the um, possible need for stronger fragrances so that we can smell each other over the mask. And then also we might need to, you know, smell each other in a way that, you know, takes into account that the fact that the some of us may not get all of our senses of smell back. So it's a, very, a brave new world, isn't it? Yes, and I'm, I'm a little bit sad that there is no more research on that. I'm personally terrified of losing my sense of smell, as most people here are, I, I believe. And, um, and I, I'm also wondering a lot, and maybe you can tell us about it, but uh, if I lose my sense of smell, well, people recover it, but people don't want to recover it the way, the way we do. Like we want to recover a hundred percent of it. And I was wondering if they are paneling people to see if they have recovered or if they, if they can even see that if the people recover all of it. And uh, yeah, social distancing and, and erotism in general and seduction in general is going to be a little bit complex and maybe, maybe it's going to be more exciting and dangerous to flirt with someone. With respect of boundaries, of course. No. <laughs> or maybe, I, know, no, so. I mean, want... wow. I think you can get it back. I hope. I hope you get it back, uh, Lisa. That's that's yeah, scary. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I hope you're I'm recovering. An acupuncture, acupuncturist, and she's been helping. So a little more every day, but there's also some. Yeah videos on YouTube called olfactory training where you take four essential oils and you really just smell them deeply every yeah. day and that's been helping too. Also what, one of the nice olfactory stories of, of my quarantine 
has been that we have a jasmine tree here that, that gives a lot of flowers. And my dad every morning goes and pick up the flowers. And, and I could see over three months that his sense of smell actually, that was not very good. Now he's becoming very, very good and subtle and he recognizes things and difference and, and smells better. So, so I think that I hope is, is you can recover all of it. And by training it, in the end, you become even better. Katie Lewis didn't have a question, but she also wanted to share that what you said about the role of smell as comfort really hit home for her. And that it was incredibly isolating not being able to smell your usual bathing products or your bed or food or people who you're close to. So thank you for sharing that. Yes, and, and, and again, in the, in the double trends that always go is people are just gonna look for functionality. Like I want this to smell like he's murdering COVID and every other disease that exists. And some other people that are buying a lot of candles, for example, candle cells are going up and, and it's because, well, candle is pure comfort, no? And, and people are creating these, they feel more empowered in their own houses and therefore candle cells, for example, could be better. And, and yeah, let's use smell for, for whatever makes us happy. And uh, Yosh actually brings up a really good question. Do you think that clean is an attempt at smell bias? Uh, meaning there's some discussion about some companies wanting to erase scent culture in certain immigrant neighborhoods. Uh, and this was a topic we covered quite a bit yesterday. So I don't know, yeah. Najib, do you have a quick response to that maybe before we move on? I know it's a big answer. Yeah, big I, I heard it yesterday. Uh, I think if you see, that, that again, one of the big trends of today, mainly in, in countries that suffer colonialism, is feeling very proud of your culture. And you can see that in people's hairs, like people are letting their hair more natural, people are letting a lot of things more natural. And, and I think that analyzing what smells are part of your culture, be it very traditional uh, ritualistic sense, or maybe just a, a fragrance type that is trending in your neighborhood, in your community, and feeling super empowered about that. And, and yeah, make, uh, make your culture strong and be proud of it and find out what your culture is. And yeah, there is a big thing to do about that and in perfume as well. Okay, thanks Najib. Bye-bye.